explain it, nah, nah Maybe it's the way you look in my eyes How I feel is beyond words can describe Hey guys, welcome back to my channel. If you're new around here, my name is Ashton and I make face videos here on YouTube. And today's video is the third episode in our Soul Study Sunday series. And today we're talking about dealing with doubt. So if you're interested in seeing this, then just keep on watching. All right, so we are back with another Soul Study Sunday. Ah. And the crowd goes wild, why? I don't know. But as I said in the intro, and as you can tell by the title, today we are talking about dealing with doubt. Now, I don't know about you, but doubt, <sighs> doubt is one of the biggest things that I deal with um, in my Christian walk um, because Satan is evil, right? And his number one tactic his number one tactic is to make us doubt what god said it's to make us doubt what god said and so in order to look at that i want to first take us this is not going to be our focus scripture for today but i want to start us here in genesis chapter 3 genesis chapter 3 and a lot of us blame Eve right for all of the horrible things in the world when we really should be blaming Adam but we're not here to debate that but a lot of us blame Eve for eating the fruit but the problem started long before she took a bite of the fruit the problem started when she allowed the enemy to plant seeds of doubt which then caused her to change her mind about what God said Again, the problem was not when she took a bite of the forbidden fruit. The problem was not when she did the act of sin, but the problem was when she allowed what the enemy said to plant doubt in her mind and change what she believed about God and his word. We're looking at um, Genesis chapter three, verse one, and I'm gonna be reading it in the New Living Translation. And it says, the serpent was the shrewdest. Um, other versions say cunning, um, sneaky. The serpent was the shrewdest of all the wild animals the Lord God had made. One day he asked the woman, did God really say you must not eat the fruit from any of the trees in the garden? Seeds of doubt. Did God really say? Did God really say? you would get pregnant did god really say that you would get married did god really say that that job was yours did god really say did god really say you must not eat the fruit from any of the trees in the garden of course we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden the woman replied it's only the fruit from the tree in the middle of the garden that we are not allowed to eat God said, you must not eat it or even touch it. If you do, you will die. You won't die, the serpent replied to the woman, doubt. God knows that your eyes will be opened as soon as you eat it and you will be like God, knowing both good and evil, doubt, right? Now the serpent is making her not only doubt the word of God, but now he's making her doubt the intentions of God. God just doesn't want you to be like him. God just doesn't want you to be happy. God just doesn't want you to be fulfilled. God just doesn't hear your cries, right? He's in the back of our mind, planting all of these seeds, making us think, question God's character. Verse six, the woman was convinced. She saw that the tree was beautiful and its fruit looked delicious and she wanted the wisdom it would give her. So she took some of the fruit and ate it. Then she gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it too. At that moment, their eyes were opened and they suddenly felt shame at their nakedness. So they sewed fig leaves together to cover themselves. So again, when we look at this passage of scripture, we see that the enemy 
his job is not or his tactic rather is not to get us to sin right he doesn't say well for most of us he doesn't say drink 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 have sex have sex have sex right lie 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 like he doesn't come at us with the sin because immediately we'll, we would be like no i'm not supposed to do that i'm not supposed to do that right he said did god really say and she said this is exactly what god said and then he says well he only said that because he only said that because he knew if you ate it, you would be like him, having wisdom and knowing the difference between good and evil. That's why he didn't want to, right? He changes and morphs our belief about God's intentions for our lives. And if I can just for a second think that maybe God is not as good as I thought he was, or maybe he doesn't care as much as I thought he did, then the sin doesn't seem as bad, right? So I wanted to start off with that um, because I think that when we know the enemy's tactic, the enemy has no new tactics, okay? He is a one show wonder. He doesn't do a lot of new stuff, right? And so when we read the Bible and we see the way that the enemy operates, we can stop him in his tracks when he is trying to operate that exact same way in our lives right when i hear that voice that says did god really say when i hear that voice that is trying to warp what i believe about god i have to not allow those thoughts to just fester so let's get into our actual focus scripture for today and if you've been in church um, or a christian for a long period of time then you've probably heard the phrase or the name doubting thomas now the same way that we like to beat up on our sister Eve, y'all like to beat up on Thomas and I am not here for it because I am going to show us in this video that we are a lot more like Thomas than we think we are and Thomas was not, Jesus did not condemn Thomas for his doubt and so I don't think we should either. Um, but I wanna talk about dealing with doubt and I want to use this verse to kind of look through it. So we're in John 20 verses 19 through 29. And I am going to be reading it from the New King James Version. It says, then the same day at evening. So this is after Jesus has resurrected and Mary. They went to go look at the tomb. They saw that it was empty. Um, and then Mary sees Jesus and um then she goes to tell the disciples that she has seen saw that she has seen jesus and so now this is the moment when jesus reveals himself to the disciples so it says then the same day at evening being the first day of the week when the doors were shut where the disciples were assembled for fear of the jews jesus came and stood in the midst and said to them peace be with you when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. So Jesus said to them again, peace to you. As the father has sent me, I also send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. Now Thomas, called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. The other disciples therefore said to him, We have seen the Lord. So he said to them, Unless I see in his hands the print of the nails, and put my finger into the print of the nails, and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. And after eight days, his disciples were again inside, and Thomas with them. Jesus came, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst and said, Peace to you. Then he said to Thomas, Reach your finger here and look at my hands, and reach your hand here and put it into my side. Do not be unbelieving, but believing. And Thomas answered and said to him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. 
And truly Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written that you may believe that Jesus Christ, that Jesus is the Christ, the son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. So let's just briefly walk through the scripture a little bit. Um, so the first thing that I wanted to point out and this is going to be more a defense video of Thomas than anything, but I hope that in my defense of him that we, um, that you guys get some help if you are dealing with doubt in your own life. So the first thing that I want to point out is that in verse 14, Mary Magdalene was the first one to see Jesus in his resurrected body, but she didn't even believe or she didn't even recognize who he was. In verse 14, it says, or even if we go back to verse 13, then they said to her, woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, because they have taken away my Lord and I do not know where they have laid him. Now, when she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there and did not know that it was Jesus. And later on in verse 15, I think it says she supposed him to be the gardener. So she did not even recognize Jesus when he returned. But they had a conversation and Mary Magdalene went and told the disciples what she had seen and heard. And then that evening, Jesus appeared to 11 of his disciples. He showed them, and this is really important, he showed them the wounds in his hands and his side. So the disciples, they're in the room, they have the doors locked because they're afraid of the Jews, right? Their king, their Lord just died and was killed and that wasn't the kingship that they were looking for, right? They didn't understand what he had meant when he told them that he was going to die or that he could destroy the temple and then three days later he would rise again. They didn't understand all of the things that he had been telling them or explaining to them up until this point. So they're scared, they're locked in um, a room and Jesus comes in the room, right? Without even opening the door. So first of all, that's already like, whoa, Jesus, what are you doing? But he comes in, he says, peace to you. And then he shows them his scars. He shows them, it says, in verse 20, as he spoke, he showed them the wounds in his hands and in his side. They received or they saw the manifestation of the miracle. They conceived the child. They got the job. They were free from the addiction. They got married. They saw the manifestation of the miracle. And then they shared their testimony with Thomas who wasn't there to see it for himself. They shared their testimony with the mom who can't seem to get pregnant. They shared their testimony with the mother of five who can't seem to get a job. They shared their testimony with the one who has been wondering if she would ever get married. They shared their testimony of the manifestation of the miracle in their life to a person who has not seen it. And I don't know about you, but there have been many times in my life where someone has shared something, a testimony with me of something that I have been praying for and it was cool for them. I was able to say congratulations to them, but it didn't come without a little pain for me. It didn't come without a little doubt for me that God could do it for me too. It didn't come without a question in my mind like, God, why? Because I'm sure Thomas was wondering, right? Jesus knows everything. God, he's God, right? He knew Thomas wasn't there. So you start to ask yourself, well, couldn't he have done it in a way that I could see it? Couldn't he have waited until I was there too? So then you start to question and you start to doubt why God isn't doing it in the way that you need him to do it for you. And so Thomas says, yeah, that's good for y'all, but I'll believe it when I see it. I understand that you know him as a healer, but I'll believe it when I see it. 
I'll believe it when my body is healed. I believe it when my grandma, my aunt, my cousin is healed. You say that God is a way maker. Well, I'll believe it when he makes a way for me. Right? We may not have been as honest as Thomas. But that doesn't mean that we haven't still been Thomas. Verse 24 says, one of the 12 disciples, Thomas, nicknamed the twin, was not with the others when Jesus came. They told him, we have seen the Lord. But he replied, I won't believe it unless I see the nail wounds in his hands, put my fingers into them, and place my hand into the wound in his side. I need to experience it for myself. I need to touch him for myself. I know what I saw when he died. I know what I saw when he died. Eight days later, the disciples were together again, and this time Thomas was with them. The doors were locked, but suddenly, as before, Jesus was standing among them. He came in the same way. Peace be with you, he says the same thing. He said, then he said to Thomas, I've heard what you have prayed for. I've heard what you asked. I've heard what you said you needed to do in order to believe. He says, put your finger here and look at my hands. Put your hand into the wound in my side. I've given you what you need to believe. I've shown up in your life specifically. I've answered your specific prayer. And then he says, don't be faithless any longer believe he did not come in convicting Thomas like why didn't you believe when they told you what Thomas asked for he gave him you need you need to see the wounds in my hand here they go you need to place your hands on my side here I am don't be faithless any longer believe No, this is not, <laughs> this is not your opportunity to then say, see, God gave him a sign, right? Because this next part is for us. Don't be faithless any longer, believe, he says to Thomas. Then verse 28, he says, my Lord and my God, Thomas exclaimed, I believe. I believe that you are who you say you are. Then Jesus told him, you believe because you have seen me. Blessed are those who believe without seeing me. Now this part is for us. This wasn't a condemnation of Thomas, but this was a foreshadowing of those who would come, right? Because as you continue on to verse 30, it says, the disciples saw Jesus do many other miraculous signs in addition to the ones recorded in this book. They walked with him, they saw him, they knew him personally, the disciples. So when they saw him, it was easy to believe in him because they had physical proof because they had physical manifestation of God walking with them. So when he says, blessed are those who believe without seeing me, he's not saying that anybody was better than Thomas because the other disciples didn't believe either until they saw him, right? They believed, they went to go tell Thomas because they had seen Jesus. Because remember before they saw Jesus, Mary Magdalene came and told them that she saw him. And we can't say for sure, but there's nothing written in the scripture that says that they leaped and jumped for joy and went out. They were still locked up, scared of the Jews, right? So neither did the other disciples believe without seeing. So this wasn't a condemnation of Thomas, but it instead was an encouragement and exhortation to those of us who would be reading this very book. Verse 30, it says, the disciples saw Jesus do many other miraculous signs in addition to the ones recorded in this book. But these are written, the miraculous signs, the words in this book. But these are written so that you, you being us, may continue to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing in him who we did not get to see, by believing in him, you will have life by the power of his name. 
And so the reason why I said, hold on, that's not your word right there, right? You do not need a sign from God is because we believe based off of the book that we read. We believe based off of God's word. And the other difference between us and Thomas, between us and the disciples, is that we have the Holy Spirit, right? We have the Holy Spirit. And so when I have the Spirit of God living inside of me, there is not room for doubt. There is not room for me to question because the Holy Spirit's job as my instructor, as my helper, is to reveal things to me. It's to reveal God's plan. It's to reveal God's word. And so when I have the gift of the Holy Spirit, I shouldn't have to see the physical manifestation of something to believe that God can do it. I shouldn't have to see the promise fulfilled before believing that God's going to do it because his word says so and his spirit in me should confirm it. So my encouragement to you, if you're dealing with doubt, is to believe it before you see it. It's to ask yourself, why am I praying for a sign? Why is the word of God not good enough? Why do I not take God at his word? God is not a man that he shall lie, nor a son of man that he should repent. Why can I not believe the word of God? Why do I need to see him perform? Who am I comparing him to that I don't believe that his word is trustworthy? Am I comparing him to my father or my mother? Am I comparing him to the friend that said that they would show up with for me but didn't? Who am I comparing God to that I doubt the very word that he speaks out of his mouth when I know that he is not a liar? What lie from the enemy am I believing? How is he twisting the word of God to make me doubt that God is still good? That he still loves me? That he still has good plans for me? And be careful, be careful, be careful, be careful to not come into a place of double-mindedness. Let's look at James chapter one. This is our last scripture. James chapter one, and I'm gonna look at my blue letter Bible. In James chapter one, verse 6 and I'm gonna just be reading this in the Christian Standard Bible uh, I guess let's go up to verse 5 it says now any of now if any of you lack wisdom he should ask God who gives to all generously and ungrudgingly and it will be given to him but let him ask in faith without doubting or without being double-minded for the doubter is like the surging sea, driven and tossed by the wind. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord, being double-minded and unstable in all his ways. Let's look at some definitions of these words. Um, so the word faith in the Greek, it says, Faith is belief with the predominant idea of trust or confidence in God. Do you trust him? Do you trust his plan for your life? Do you trust that he is really a good father? The word doubting, it means to separate, to make a distinction, to discriminate, to prefer to be at variance with oneself or to hesitate. That is so interesting. That it means to separate or withdraw. When I doubt God, I'm separating myself from him. I'm withdrawing from him because I think that I can protect myself. I think that my way is better. I think that I have my best interest in heart and at heart and he doesn't. 
the word double-minded it means divided in interest a doubtful man is a double-minded one divided in interest in interest and God says that you should not receive anything because you are unstable in all of your ways because you can be tossed to and fro when we think about Eve right because she doubted God because she was double-minded she was unstable right the enemy could speak anything into her life and it would make her question God it would make her wary right she was unstable in all of her ways and we don't want to be like that there's a quote I want to read as we wrap up from John MacArthur it says for some reason we think of doubt and worry as small sins but when a Christian displays unbelief or an inability to cope with life he is saying to the world my God cannot be trusted and that kind of disrespect makes one guilty of a fundamental error, the heinous sin of dishonoring God. That is no small sin. <sighs> Let me pray for us. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this day that you have made. I thank you that you are a good, good father. I thank you that you are not a man that you should lie. I thank you that the word that you have spoken over each and every one of our lives cannot come back void, but it must accomplish, but it must accomplish what you set out for it to do. Lord, we repent for the times that we doubted whether or not you were good, that we doubted your character, that we doubted your words, and that we didn't take it at face value, Lord, that we didn't truly believe your word when you said it. Help our unbelief, Lord. Help us grow in our faith. Help us trust you, Lord, so that we are not double-minded, so that we are not divided in interest, Lord. Help us to fully and wholeheartedly believe you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Thank you guys so much for watching. We have one more video in this mental health series. Um, and so I hope that these have been helpful. Let me know what else you want to talk about on these Soul Study Sundays. And of course, um, comment down below, how is your soul doing? Let me know um, in the comment section below. If you've made it to the end of this video, thank you for watching. And I have a gift for you. Um, if you have not seen the trailer in the other videos or the promo video, I guess, then you do not know that uh, my best friend and I, we are hosting a conference July 14th and 15th, 2023. It's called The Encounter Conference. And I truly believe that every woman needs to be in that room. But space is limited, so please make sure to grab your ticket before we sell out. Um, but as a thank you to watching this video, you can use the promo code JESUS10 to get 10% off of your ticket once again that's jesus 10 to get 10 percent off your ticket thank you so much for watching and i will see you guys in my next video bye there is still a remnant that remains of women who dare to believe that god wants to shake up the earth of women who dare to believe that God is establishing his kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. It's time. It's time for those who have been sleeping to wake up. It's time for boldness, breakthrough, miracles, healing, deliverance, restoration, revival. Playtime is over. Everywhere your foot treads, may the earth tremble.